you will always have a point where you'll feel that you're not good enough. And the only way to come out of it is that you get deeper, right? You dig deeper, whatever it is, right? If you don't have that knowledge, which is widespread, the problem will come that, okay, hey, if the issue has come, somebody will reach out to you because you will only have that knowledge. Like, there is very tiny percentage of people who learns from different people's experiences, right? Yeah. And they are the successful ones. Uh, and this is very crucial as a manager and leader, right? If you're not giving, giving enough time for teams to do things, dig deep enough deeper, yeah. like you are constantly doing the feature fact building, which is the feature factory examples. Yeah. You will end up with these problems. There is no way to solve it if you are in that zone, right? But surprisingly, what they say is that becoming an on-call once a month is not a problem. It's the intensity of that week that people don't like. If you're an on-call engineer, what are you productively doing it? Are you just manning those alerts and just like creating tickets and moving on? Or are you solving those for forever, right? If what are you supposed to do? Uh, are people even clear about this? Or are there scenarios where most of the time, yes, there is an alert, but nobody knows how are they supposed to react to it? Welcome to the podcast Engineering Unplugged with me, Bhavin. Thank you to 10 Exchange for very graciously sponsoring today's episode. Today we have Rajneesh Prakash, Associate Director of Engineering at Dunzo. I and Rajneesh chat about practical limits to knowledge sharing and alerting strategies amongst other things. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Please subscribe for more such content. And we're live. Uh, hey Rajneesh, how are you doing? Hi Bhavan, I'm good, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Welcome to uh, the podcast, Engineering Unplugged. Um, last time we had Amit and glad to have you here. Thank you for taking out the time to chat with us. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah. So I'm Rajneesh and uh, I lead engineering on partner side at Danjo uh, right now as Associate Director of Engineering. Uh, been about 11, 12 years in industry. Um, work with Walmart, ClearTrip, Cerner's. Uh, have been work, working with uh, different uh, kind of tech stacks, right? Java, Golang, uh, Python, ROR. So have flavor of that understanding, the kind of challenges it throws at. So yeah, let's dive in. Uh, let's talk about an experience where you got challenged um, pretty intensely on the personal front. Uh, typically, this can be a few years um, back in your career and this was a situation that was a very limiting situation for you uh, and that prevented you from growing and then you managed to break through uh, those barriers and today those learnings are one of the very dear learnings for you um, in this category uh, which what experience do you have what would you like to share so I really have a fair share of those learnings uh, like uh, at multiple events of my career right yeah uh, like uh, once when like probably and I think most of us could relate to that journey because see uh, at some point we all have felt that there is a stagnancy in the, your career and you want to break out of that ceiling and so I think first six years when I was in first two companies and it was becoming little mundane uh, had a lot more time uh, like I wanted to uh, like at, at that point I was even exploring uh, I actually did a startup uh, on my side uh, in that sense. Oh, so, wow. you know, for a year. So that, that is just to highlight that I had so much of plenty of time to figure out those things as well. Hmm. And uh, what it happens that then usually you are slowing down some of the learnings, which actually comes out of working, right? And working intensely, going deeper in the ecosystem. And that, that was the point when I uh, actually decided to move to a startup, right? To have a like learning which is coming at a very fast pace. And I was pretty much aware that I probably will not succeed, right? Uh, like I had that fear from uh, beginning itself. So cracking the interview and which we most prepare for is a different aspect of the job, right? Yeah. But doing working is a different aspect altogether. And while I got the job, I was still scared in my head that, hey, how, how am I going to do? And when I started getting it done, so the first project I got there was to break down the monolith and uh, breaking it in Microsoft was uh, like it was to be scaling uh, 
like I think we were looking at forex scale, which was coming to right, and there were uh, sales events which was coming up. So we had to start right. preparing our ecosystem and that. And uh, I was like, in my head, uh, I was just saying to myself, like, how how am I going to do that? The people around me, even the probably relatively junior people felt that like they had so much of deep knowledge, right? And I was like coming with a surface knowledge and I still had to do so much. Uh, so it was pretty challenging. First figuring out those, understanding domain, understanding people, understanding the kind of complexity which comes in. I was also transitioning between the tech stack. For the last one year, I was working in Perl and then suddenly I had to move to Java and then the mm -hmm. Spring. And Spring Boot, I had never touched. I had worked in Java and starts in past. So it was again a learning curve there. I started yeah. using, and so when we decided to build, break it into microservices, we also decided that we will be asynchronous. We will have event-driven architecture. And we took the Kafka layer on that. And uh, just to avoid that kind of uh, overall learning, right? Which learning curves comes at. What we did that we built a wrapper library on top of it so that the, the consumption across the organization becomes easier. And we built it uh, through a paradigm called Reactive Java, which is a functional flavor in Java, right? Now, yeah. learning curve for me was like getting back to Java, learning again, learning Spring Boot, and getting to depth of it because I'm the one who is leading the project and people around me need my guidance. So, and then they're learning the functional paradigm as well. So, it was a like all together a different set of challenge right uh, and the only thing when in hindsight we like i look at i figure that uh what helped me was getting deeper right like it was not just a surface level knowledge that okay hey you how do you use this project reactor library in your project or how do you build a crud application using the uh this right uh, yeah. it was like what kind of challenges the design would through the domain understanding. What is the do domain boundary? Like when you're breaking down the uh, monolith, what boundaries do you decide for? Uh, so like, I think the whole monolith was capturing the payments entity, the booking entity, all, all together, right? Not getting into specific the domain model, but like it was all captured together. And when you're separating out, you still like eventual product, which will come out still very far. And you have to run the system in parallel to which is live, right? So yeah. you have, when you're breaking down, you're taking incremental steps. And then you're deciding the ownership of those entities as well at, at the same time. So the complexity, not only from the learning part, but also uh, it starts to become that how do you, whatever you have learned, how do you impart that to whole team, right? When you're building. Because if it's just contained within you, like then you are the single point of failure when you call it a distributed system, right? Either like whatever happens and, and it's not, it's a very bad state to be in when, uh, and as a manager, when I started practicing some of this, right? Yeah. Right? What happens when you take a lead, right? For a week and then you come back and see, you see like what kind of challenges your team is struggling with and what kind of problem you're facing. And then you know down and solve for those, right? And same thing happens as a engineer also, right? If the, uh, the context and the awareness is not spread out, right? And that's where it's imparting that knowledge, what you have garnered, the coaching. Like we usually talk about the KTEs and uh, like- uh, The documentation. Like formal ways of coaching, right? Like yeah. documentation, KTEs, etc. That are obviously very helpful uh, in longer run. But then in shorter run, what works is like talking to people, right? And informal chats. That like, like you go out a tea break, you go out a, a, a chai break or you go out a lunch break and there is a group, right? And I, and like, I'm not a tea lover. Like I, I don't actually have it, but I still used to walk with people. Yeah. It, that bits of knowledge is like, which comes with the context of being in the system, right? It will never come if you just learning some system design aspect, some theoretical knowledge that will never come. It will like, for, for example, one anecdotal example I have is uh, one day on 31st December, which is like uh, insanely from any commerce website, 31st and 1st are sales, like sale events. Yes. Uh, the classical problem was the ID generation problem, which broke down. So there was a script which broke down on 31st. 
and uh, that was because uh, the script was written in a way that it used to reset at certain frequency at certain number and that overflow the limit because the script had a failure and then they did not have a monitoring on it so that those are like classical problems which you will never hear in theory right these will only come with someone's experiences that how did you tackle that kind of problem like we had to be aware at available at 11 pm when people are going at uh, party re being ready to the party welcoming the new year at 12 we are welcoming that hey id generation has broken now we got to fix it <laughs> in a short time right so your party <laughs> right and so like and how do you deal with that problem how do you bring it up and uh, the learnings out of it that hey, what kind of monitoring we going to have on it that this never comes up right uh, or how do you solve like actually right what are different uh, design solutions to solve that right uh, and what are different like like design solutions are very subjective like uh, we all talk about the excellent design solutions but in practical you always have a trade offs right yes you are sometimes trading off with the time sometimes trading with the cost and like you are figuring out what's best in that scenario so in hindsight if you look at whatever system we have built in last 10 years probably you could do a lot more different now right having that exposure and experiences yeah so i think it's the key, I would put it that uh, the learnings and the challenges was that uh, you will always have a point where you'll feel that you're not good enough. And the only way to come out of it is that you get deeper, right? You dig deeper, whatever it is, right? If it is a technology, if it is a language, uh, or it's a problem which like of domain, which you're not able to understand how to solve. Yeah. You need to understand like very very well you need to so uh, like uh, one thing which i really remember very, very vividly that i even had gone deeper into project reactor every single class file how they have implemented the reactive uh, paradigm and para functional paradigm and that is what helped me to model at how we are consuming and building a library on top of it so hmm. i don't think i the people like uh, nowadays when i see like people actually just consume it than just understanding the actually deeper layer. So my input there would be that like just to come out, you will have to dig really deeper and then figure out a way how do you impart that knowledge to wider audience, right? So uh, let me get this right. You are saying that you were new uh, in this company, in this new job. The technology was new to you. Right. The programming paradigm, which is the functional paradigm, was new to you. Uh, the framework that you were working with, uh, Spring Boot, was right. new to you. Correct. Uh, and the domain was also, uh, you know, quite complex and you had to uh, break down this monolith and uh, extract out microservices out of it. Correct. Correct. In all of this frenzy, the challenge was not the newness of the language, the newness of the framework, and uh, even the newness of the programming paradigm. The right. challenge was that people were keeping um, their thoughts in their own head and there was not enough knowledge sharing that was happening and that was causing the system to not grow further yeah yeah in some wow. senses uh, yeah uh, that is what it is because see like with initially what when we started building out we were able to build uh, right with uh, like one people leading or i leading it i having the knowledge yeah like it's not just the building part right system gonna last beyond that three months when you're building, right? And six months when you're building. And and then you're gonna do a feature addition, you're gonna do uh, the enhancement on top of it, you're gonna do maintenance of it. And that's where that having the knowledge of it will really, really help grow your teams, right? And uh, such a, for example, uh, if you don't have that knowledge, which is widespread, the problem will come that, okay, hey, if the issue has come, somebody will reach out to you because you will only have that knowledge if it is not widespread. Hmm. So it's important that, that that challenge is uh, addressed early on where you are really keeping that in vision, right? So if you're not sharing, it becomes like things are definitely going to break. That's the nature of the software, right? Um, yeah. And uh, when it breaks, if you are the only one who knows about it, then one, you will be woken up or you know be interrupted from whatever you're doing um uh, but also it is very stressful for the team as a whole correct um uh, 
you might be available yes you will answer it but uh, um, it just adds to the stress because the team as a whole now has to come out of what they are doing right. and jump into firefighting this situation which seemingly they don't know like anything about and right. only one person knows about it do you see people make this uh, mistakes today uh, mistake of not sharing uh, the thoughts the um, mental models uh, yeah. of what they are building i, I think uh... Like to fair say in last two, three years, right? After we have become mostly hybrid and remote, this has this problem has actually gotten a little worse, right? Um, because the informal way of uh, sharing actually have almost diminished, right? Uh, like, yeah. like when we were interns, when we were like junior engineers, we had a way to reach out to our senior engineers and just ask candidly, right? Yeah, you could just walk up to somebody on their desk. Uh, yeah. just have a chai conversation water cooler conversation like i i still remember like yeah. in my first job like i had a senior dba uh, and i just went to him and asked like how is this query engine optimization working right like how is this query tuning is happening yeah he was able to explain it and i didn't have to read any article and like that still stays with me yeah imagine reading about it for like 3 hours and understanding like 20% of it uh -huh. right. yeah so like that kind of in last 3 4 years whatever generation has come in job right and at least for like probably a year before covid right yeah i think they haven't experienced that sort of informal imparting of knowledge and that's the biggest uh, risk i see at this point that how do and the biggest problem statement that we should address at some, in some ways um but like and and, and also the second set of people which i see why this is a problem for that obviously it's remote it's wide and the second is people are mostly worried about uh, like hey am i building system from scratch right and uh, and that is only because they get lot of breadth there, right because you need to write a uh, repository layer you need to write the data layer you need to uh, write the access layer like all, all of those right and the, yeah. you have to choose like different technology stacks and uh, different technology elements so your breadth really really increases and that's what people have assumed that that is the only way of learning things at a very rapid pace it does though it it's it it's not uh, i'm not saying that it doesn't do yeah for sure it, it doesn't give you the deeper knowledge and then what happens that you become in the cyclic chain that okay hey i've learned this project now i need to move on to something shiny again right like the you are not getting to depth of like uh, problems which you can actually surface by being at the same problem for a consistently longer period of time right and that is what i see uh, like uh, like the some people who have stayed like in some organizations right like yeah. people have stayed for 4 years 5 years and they know these kind of problems but uh, like only that gets uncovered when there is on call issue there is a sos which comes in and they they are called in rc calls they are called in that sos calls and they tell you okay, hey this is how we can deal again by then you have lost the half an hour of business one hour of business half of the people who are on call are debugging it they have lost their head by then right <laughs> so it's 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 just because if those people have put in their foot and that's where i feel the also the understanding the responsibility that what is senior engineer what are the architects responsibility right we always talk about um, building things from scratch correct yeah so we always talk about this coding and non coding architects right like how much one should code code right yeah i i don't think the i in my head at least in uh, my principles uh, i don't think there is a contrast to it that you should be coding or not coding right you can be coding you should be able to coding is like by default that's the com competency you should have right yeah if you're not choosing to code like what are you doing like is important how are you spreading that knowledge to your teams right that is the key as a senior engineer and architect like what are you doing what are how are you putting the checkpoints that everybody is understanding everybody is developing that kind of the learning which you have had over the years like otherwise what is the difference between a engineer who has two years experience and other four years it's just the difference that they have seen a different types of problem statements and they have seen for relatively long right yeah. so they have seen some sort of challenges which comes only by solving that problem consistently 
and right. with the which comes up. So I think that's the key difference, which I see that these are two things because of the remote one, people are become not getting that informal way of learning. The second is the senior engineers probably are not aware that how should they impart these kind of uh, knowledges and what is the benefit out of it and what is that like, and probably it's not finally ingrained, not uh, put in bullet points as a responsibility that, Hey, you want to do this. But I think this is pretty important, pretty key to anybody succeeding in the org. Awesome. You mentioned very interesting points, Rajneesh. Uh, so to bring out some of the nuggets, right? Yeah. Uh, you're saying that people don't share and then it leads to uh, production issues and uh, production issues, which the on-call is not able to debug because they don't know the intricacies of the system that they are on-call for. Um, uh, this is definitely stressful. We talked about it. Yeah. Uh, um, just, but just, also... one, just one second there. Uh, I uh -huh. just want to add one more thing there. Yeah. So usually, right, like what I've seen, uh, I mean, again, it differs from companies to companies, right? And kind of what kind of processes you have in place. Um, I really hate when we are on SOS call and that calls doesn't get solved within five to 10 minutes, right? And we don't find things. Like, oh man, like in how many years, times, right? how many times has it happened? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's actually, I feel like that's a failure on ourselves, right? That we have not been able to bring the team or ourselves to yes a ability where we can solve anything in the next five to 10 minutes. Right. And though we know the system. So yes. that's where the gap is, right? Like if we, if it takes something to solve for 30 minutes, we are really not doing well as a team. Right. Yeah, bang on. So this is what we are talking about, the learning side right. of it um, and the consequences of not learning and not spreading the knowledge. So one, it is stressful, but right. second, also you don't end up solving the on-call issue uh, uh, in a reasonably short amount of time, in a few minutes. Uh, I have seen SOS calls that have spanned across hours, yeah. Yeah. two, three, four hours. And for four hours, people are on the call and it, it's like just so stressful. But uh, you also mentioned something very, very interesting that because it is stressful for the people who are involved in those calls, by the end of it, they have lost the zeal to learn from it completely. And um, um, in most cases, people don't end up learning even from those uh, on call situations. So one thing is to proactively share your knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And you are saying people should do that. And um, uh, water cooler conversations and chance conversations, chance conversations are a way to do it, yeah. uh, which is harder in the COVID times and the hybrid times. Right. But those are the proactive knowledge sharing. Mm -hmm. When the chance interactions through SOS calls are happening. And you actually have a chance to learn even in the hybrid settings because you are forced into those situations. People don't end up learning right. because they are consumed into um, the stress of it, the stress of not knowing yeah. and then solving. Why do people not share? Like why? I mean, this seems like a very obvious point, right? Uh, why, is, why are people repeating this same behavior again and again? What do you see as a limiting uh, factor or a limiting belief? Uh, I, I don't think it's related to individuals, right? It's also, uh, they need this formal coaching. So a lot of times when we say, right, um, that, uh, like, hey, uh, we, whatever, we should learn from others' experiences, right? But most often than not, all of us actually make those mistakes and learn from those experiences. And we don't end up, like, there is very tiny percentage of people who learns from different people's experiences right yeah and they are the successful ones right but still like the wider audience 80 to 90 percent to my belief uh, is like still you tell them like hey this is not the right direction they will do that they'll learn from it and then th that learning will stay for them with them so i think it's somewhere that factor also at play that people uh unless they get into such situation. For example, I'm talking about these problems now, right? When I have had experiences of these problems facing yeah. myself as I see as a manager and um, as a leader both, right? Um, but I'm not sure if five, when I was like three years in IT industry, like I would have reacted and I would have same kind of uh, understanding, right? About it. So I think that's one. 
the second part is i i think we do need the formal uh, kind of a responsibility tagging right and formal so we always have like for managers uh, we tell that these are your responsibility that you got to do the stakeholder management you got to own the execution you got to own the people management right you define everything right like every uh, competency metrics for senior engineers for uh, and uh, like i'm again speaking primarily probably to the company which are growing up right because they are still yeah. finding the frameworks of like how do they build company how do they uh, build organization and that's where this formal uh, responsibility tagging like what should one engineer be responsible for what are they their metrics and th and how should they be co it's not just about drafting a constitution around that hey you're gonna do the mentoring right it's also about how are you coaching as a as a, as a manager how am i tell telling my team leads that hey you're gonna take care you're gonna talk to teams about this right whatever learnings we have had like how do you how are you doing that how yeah you have to lead by example i mean if people have right. never seen it happen you have to do it with them uh and then they'll learn right and that's where you are and the second part is like you as you rightly said you lead by example you create that opportunity and the second set of is like how do you create that window for them right uh, and this is very crucial as a manager and leader right if you're not giving giving enough time for teams to do things dig deep enough deeper yeah like, you are constantly doing the feature fact building which is the feature factory examples yeah you will end up with these problems there is no way to solve it if you are in that zone right like, so you will have to figure out a room like as a leader how your teams find that window that where they are investing in themselves right and that's where these are two key things like how are you coaching and how are you giving them that room to grow you know i was wondering when you were talking rajneesh um yeah. that in college what is the default behavior let's say you are going through uh, your engineering college your bca mca college uh, is there a framework or is are there kpis that tells you that you have to sit with your fellow students and uh, uh, you know discuss things with them not really but people do it people naturally end up doing it because the environment allows them that time to do right. it they are uh, you know learning in the same classroom and then there are lunch breaks there are tea breaks and uh, you know what not there are labs and you have all sorts of like interaction uh, right. opportunities with people i wonder why that doesn't continue when um, you know people come on the job is that because that is taken away as you rightly mentioned we have all witnessed it that sometimes you know especially in the early and the mid stage startups um things can get quite busy and um um the focus can mostly be on feature building that you have to write code you have to you know ship prs you have to ship features to production and that's the sole focus and many a times the uh, success metrics are also measured around just how much you ship or how many features have you given out and um uh, so in a sense we have taken away that liberty and that's where your point comes in that because we have taken away that liberty the onus is now back onto the leadership to actually put it back in and create that time for people create those opportunities for people to be able to chat with others and uh, spread the knowledge yeah i i think you brought a very right example of colleges right and while you said that there is no kri uh, and kpis right and yeah. but there is like an, at least in indian construct it is that we are driven through the mark system we have a framework which is being chased that you have pass examinations and so that's your kpis uh, and that's what is giving you motivation around that okay i have to study the no second, but you can very well sit in a room and just study by yourself right why would you interact with people uh -huh. no so i'm coming to that that is the second part which is told about the environment and environment is like giving you the plenty of free free time where you could do things right your 5 hours is the class window where you are studying and we are limited and beyond that it's your time either you study or you don't study you gossip with your friend or you talk about the system at depth right that's how, like it's not that always you are studying you are gossiping also so it's the freedom of the choices which is making people do different things and invest in that right whoever is uh, trying to learn so taking that same example uh, now if you talk like you just mentioned about 
that le leadership owners being on leadership which is rightly like i would say completely true i would just add one more thing uh, so there are, how have teams and people have become busy there are two aspects of it one is uh, the company or the uh, team has become a feature factory which is just focusing and that's where the leader has to solve it second set of it is in, as individuals also i see engineers have become tad busy in two things one in the race of growth uh, and the growth by switching the companies so then you are con in constant mode of preparation for the next job yeah right so if you are getting a learning which is as i said that the breadth you are doing your signy work which is building a new service or a new feature then you are happy and as soon as that diminishes you are constantly looking at uh, the next set of things which you could do either inside or the outside and that is the constant mode of like it's a journey for you right like you're constantly hopping from one thing to the other and and that's where you are like not invested too much enough in learning what you have already had at your place right so instead of you are prioritizing something else so i think that's also something as a individual uh you let to like uh, like that will be my recommendation to like all of the engineers or like uh, like which i also try and do that how am i investing and in learning wherever i am right and probably i am not great sort of example because even i have switched every two or two or three years right yeah i still would like to extend it a bit further but uh, having said that like the only realization i have is that uh, like instead of me trying to prepare for interview if i could invest that time in digging deeper and understanding the domain and uh, understanding the current ecosystem like not always you have solved all the problem right and uh, and going wider going deeper in your ecosystem i think that will have an insane value add to your growth right and i, I think i heard somewhere uh, somebody saying uh, that we always are in constant race of this monetary compensation revival that okay hey i hope i'll get x growth or y growth and that's why we are constantly preparing for interviews i think if you start thinking ourselves like hey like what is my value proposition today and what will take me to get to x amount and what will require me what kind of a skill and competency will require like it could be ownership it could be mentoring not just a skill competency it could be the depth in the same system i could actually go ahead and talk to my manager with and my leaders with that okay hey i bring that value addition now like and i probably deserve that x or y compensation so there are different ways to do the same conversation it's uh, it's also that people don't open up right and uh, like and that's the sad uh, truth about it that uh and it's both ways like uh, the leader versus the uh, team like if they don't open up enough they don't know enough that what kind of motivation each one has i think these are the problems which crop up yeah yeah the culture definitely flows top down so if you have a leader who is open who is you know open to uh like fair criticism um constructive criticism as well that goes a long way in uh, people becoming comfortable and yeah of course there is uh, like couldn't agree with you more there is a lot of value in staying at your current place and figuring out how can you go to the next level while staying here the benefits are that you know the systems but also you know the people and you have built your relationships and you have grown your network in the current company so that can be a good support system to push you up um yeah. and for you to take that uh support while you are growing and while you are tackling other challenges if you move to a new place then the system is new the people are new um and uh yeah so it's a different struggle uh let's go back to the production incident uh related conversation that we were having right, right. so many people rajneesh that i chat with more often than not their frustration is around oh my on call schedule is so brutal and uh i am an on call once every month once every six weeks because typically in the small companies teams are small and you have four to six people team and on calls are weekly um but surprisingly what they say is that becoming an on call once a month is not a problem it's the intensity of that week that people don't like and um it goes back to as you said the uh, lack of knowledge sharing 
that happens but also lack of sound approach to solving some of these problems yeah uh right and by far um i mean there are a few like there are a few aspects to uh you know these conversations one is that it is stressful for people but second is the amount of time that is wasted and by far people waste so much time in just handling uh on call stuff correct uh, yeah. and on call stuff that could have been very very easily prevented very easily prevented with uh, right set of playbooks with right set of knowledge uh, sharing sessions uh, and uh, even water cooler conversations you know there is only so much of structured documentation that you can do um um so the point i'm trying to make here is the time wasted in solving production incident uh, incidents um and what would follow from that is how do you save that time yeah. right one is to do knowledge sharing but second is uh, alerting and um uh, you know simple alerting simple monitoring uh what are the challenges in that area uh, that yeah, you i think so uh, actually on call process is uh, like is it like it evolves at a different maturity level with the team also right like the kind of the team which you have been able to build and what kind of maturity level they have in the kind of context right which again uh, like comes from your knowledge sharing and others but from beyond that right like i have seen some examples that where team actually don't need lot more context and the on call life have been really really easy and that's only achieved through like the kind of system health which you can monitor and like like there are proper ci cd where the, the code itself is not accidentally moving in right and uh, like there are enough test coverages which are accidental mistakes are being provided like uh, avoided completely so those those are the way the second was aspect of it is that which is really really challenging right and uh, i mean as a on call what are the like things which we look at one is like operational issues which comes in the system issues that is the second category right and the third is like the domain context issues right to solve some of these system, each of those category either the operational issues or the system issues what are what are the examples can you take an example of an operational issue or system issue and a domain issue so for example let's say uh, uh, like in any uh, commerce website right yeah uh, if there was a booking which was happening and your delivery was supposed to happen now on that delivery if eta was showing x minute and now suddenly there is a great delta it is right now uh, like you don't know how that eta is being computed right and uh, for to solve that do you need a person who knows the eta ecosystem how that is built how is that being derived the logic of it uh, what are different components involved are there third party systems involved do you understand that enough right so that's the knowledge part of it the second is that do you have a proper monitoring system in place right that which can detect all of these anomalies and tell you that okay these are the problem so you don't even actually need to debug right that like these problems would arise the systems can tell you themselves that okay hey there is a deviation in how the external like external system which was giving you the input now has a deviation in what kind of response time or the sle breaches it is happening now if you are able to derive and connect both operational issues and this like you don't need the domain context at that point and you can just say that system has deteriorated on probably the third party component and you can probably resist record work with that and you can try and solve and focus on the root cause right then first figuring out where does the problem lie like most of our time spent you rightly talked about our time being wasted right and the wasted is only where we are uh, like it's not to fix the root cause right if you are able to fix the root cause that's a right investment actually right the problem is yeah the time taken to find the root cause is like huge and that's the wastage every time you will come back to the same thing, right and if you don't have contact like the next time the new on call will come he will not have that shared contact 
he'll come and so, uh, still debug and take the same amount of uh, time before he reaches to root cause. So that's where the two key elements are like, how do you mature as systems where you're monitoring their health really, really? It's also complex. This as, as, of, as of now, uh, this is a very iterative process, right? That you add some of the like very common understanding alerts, right? What are throughput alerts, the baseline deviations, uh, the RPMs, right? And the latency monitoring. Then you add the very specific custom business domain alerts. And then you like you would have missed out where the coverage is not 100%, right? And then you missed out on some uses alert. And that is causing something else, right? And so it's very iterative in that sense. But at least having fair share of monitoring setup on the quality gate side, um, I think that's that's a really helpful to reduce this. The other way uh, beyond the monitoring is like how are you actually investing that on call time, right? And this applies to like as a manager, as a leader, to uh, individual, also as an engineer. That if you're an on-call engineer, what are you productively doing it? Are you just manning those alerts and just like creating tickets and moving on? Or are you solving those for forever, right? If you're able to do, then probably you are diminishing the kind of the on-call issue which will keep coming, right? Yeah. And that's the kind of right intent to solve and be on-call. That at every single time, I'll reduce the kind of on-call issues which comes the next week. So are you bandaging the current situation, thereby solving just the current instance of the problem? Or are you sol solving the pattern of the problem, thereby eradicating that pattern uh, for a foreseeable future? Right, right. Uh, let's go back to the three uh, types of issues that we talked about. Uh, right. Operational issue, system issue, and domain issue. The domain issues example was that, uh, let's say there is a domain level number that is being computed, let's say an ETA for an order getting delivered and right. that number is getting computed, right. but it's wrong. So there is no exception in the system, but the number is coming out to be a clearly, clearly wrong value. And right. somebody needs to debug that. That's an example of a domain issue. Uh, so typically, um, let's say a customer or a support team, um, maybe a business person who is testing the app is going to raise such an issue. Right. A system level issue is, uh, as you mentioned, that an API's response time is going beyond a certain threshold or uh, the CPU utilization of a database is going above a certain threshold. These are typical system issues. Um, uh, what's an operational issue? Is an operational issue that a particular flow, let's say an order flow in an e-commerce example, failed midway. And that particular ordered uh, order suffered um, exceptions. And now you have to like debug just that one case. So there are real issues, but it's like limited to one order uh, yeah. or a few orders. And that is that an operational issue? Yeah, I think uh, it's a thin boundary at operation and domain, right? So I would okay. uh, keep in a mixture. Operational there is probably like, let's say, so every uh, product which you have built has an end user, right? And yeah. has a supporter ecosystem. Like if you are a marketplace, like there are probably supply economy on the ground, the support system, which is there, right? Uh, if so, user being impacted is one thing, right? Uh, the other is where you, like your support ecosystem is not able to function to serve users, right? And uh, like uh -huh. it could be like your op uh, like operators if you have to help them out, right? Uh, it could be your like let's say if you are uh, in store or you are uh, like if you are a travel booking system like let's say in that case probably uh, your booking agents which they are facing the issues, right? So in like inherently your users are impacted, but this is because your uh, support ecosystem is facing challenge, right? So those are also the operational issues. Uh, and, to and so now, now more real time in nature to be solved, right? Yes. Because, because those are urgent. Like there is a business revenue loss. There are user trust loss and, and all experiences which are going for toss. So I think that, that I would put it as a operational issues. Okay, so now let's go into the nature of these three issues. As you said, operational issues are more real time. And it is a problem that's happening right now to somebody, uh, maybe a support operator, maybe a specialized end user. Right. And you have to solve the issue for them. Um, and I'm looking at this now from saving the team's time uh, 
uh, in solving on call uh, issues uh, yeah. like if we were to reduce the time that the team spends on the on call stuff mm -hmm. where would we want to attack so operational issues uh, them being one off uh, are they more difficult in terms of predicting beforehand and hence it is harder to put alerts on them is that the correct read uh, that there is a limit to how many how much alerting can you put on the operational issues but the other two the system issues and the domain issues for example if a wrong eta is being shown if the eta is above a certain threshold it's clearly clearly a wrong value and you would want to get alerted right. for somebody to check uh, and of course, the disk or the CPU utilizations, if they are going, uh, or the response times, if they are going or breaching thresholds, uh, then it's very easy to put alerts on them. But the yeah. operational issues are much harder to create alerts for. Yes, uh, I mean, so uh, operational issues has too many nuances, right? Like uh, we talk about distributed system, and that that's itself is a challenge. Like it's a distributed human ecosystem, right? Yeah. We talk about operational system. So there is a system involved, there are humans involved, and there are different ways people would try, right? Um, and there would be a different kind of uh, issues which can come up. So there are extent at which you can think and set the business alerts and the operational alerts, but beyond that, you will still end up facing new kind of scenarios every time, right? Uh, it's, uh, so if I have to uh, talk about why it is harder, and how you can attack some of these and like, uh, and do I think if on call should be engineers should prioritize this or not? See, I think as a principle, uh, operational issues, I do not like on call engineers to really attack uh, because that's something which is like, it's reactive way of solving, right? Yes. You don't have an SOP, it's gonna take a little longer. If engineer comes and we don't know the problem, then you will end up debugging and it's a real time problem. So you're like losing that business. Hour. So I really don't like uh, the, that operational issues that on call spending time. Uh, the way in which I would like to approach and there are fears here is that how much of SOPs you are creating with all of these issues so that like, let's say there are support engineering PACs team, which can automatically do that. How are you uh, telling system to uh, like, how you have built system capabilities to heal itself, right? That those uh, issues do not crop up the next time. Right? So that's another way of thinking, right? That for example, let's say uh, there are operational issues because, uh, and and mind you, like operational issues also are a function of system issue in some senses, right? Something yeah. is going because at the at your backend or at a system level, there is something which is not right, right? Be it with the logic or be it with some of the scaling challenges or be it with some of the system health, right? Now, so all of these are symptoms and the symptoms gets reported as operation issues, right? That, okay, hey, I'm facing a challenge. Then yeah, so you're, you're saying that an operational issue is basically a gap in the system, whether it's a long tail case that you haven't handled because you thought it was never going to occur, but right. now it has started occurring. Um, uh, or some uh, simple technical case like a null handling, etc. missing right. in some of the places. And that causes that flow to fail. And mm -hmm. the way to fix the operational issue is to basically take uh, a bug and just patch it so that yeah. it doesn't occur again. Uh, yeah. And there is little alerting that you can do. So I want to shift the focus back to the alerting. And the point that I think we are both sub substantiating here is that operational issues you can't really monitor because you could, th then the fix is not, um, you know, um, uh, to like the fix is in the code. Correct. You have to patch the code. So if you knew about it beforehand, you would have patched it. And yeah. in either case, uh, the monitoring and the alerting system doesn't play a role in operational issues. Right. If we go to the system and the business uh, domain sort of issues, do you see people do the right alerting uh, on them? Uh, I mean, like, do the alerts exist? And if they exist, if they don't, like, that's a whole different problem by itself. But if it does, then do people know how to respond to those alerts? Let's say I got, let's take a very simple example, uh, a particular API response time is more than, uh, you know, the historical P95 is uh, 30 seconds. And for the last five minutes, the average response time is more than, um, uh, sorry, I, I meant 30 milliseconds. And the, like for the last um, uh, five minutes, the average has gone above 
the historical P95. So now the average is more than 30 milliseconds mm -hmm. and you get an alert. Right. Uh, another example could be that a database uh, CPU is, you know, beyond 80% right. and it has sustained 80%, more than 80% for about five minutes and you right. get an alert. Yeah. What are you supposed to do? Uh, are people even clear about this or are there scenarios where most of the time, yes, there is an alert, but nobody knows how are they supposed to react to it? Yeah, I, I think it's again, uh, team maturity level differs from uh, team to team and that's how like people would behave. Like I, I've seen uh, kind of challenges where uh, people actually struggle to figure out what metrics they should watch out for. Like it should be the P95 and what kind of threshold they should have. Like for timeout, what kind of uh, like should you set? Uh, in some cases, there are very high thresholds of timeouts, right? Yeah. Five seconds. Like that's that's the really, really gonna cause you trouble someday, right? And so it's very uh, subjective to the kind of team's maturity level as well. That how do they understand the alerting ecosystem? Uh, how do they understand the alerts, right? Like for example, most of the places we usually use Neuralink or Opsini, etc., right? Alerting or Pager Duty, right? Which uh, pages the alerts and then you land into Neuralink and you look at the metrics. Uh, one part is that understanding what you are measuring. That is one, right? So that's obviously you have to impart that knowledge and understanding within your team and ensure that every engineer is equipped to understand those uh, metrics, right? Like what you're watching out for. The second set is, which is little tricky to my mind uh, and little difficult as well is getting the coverage complete, right? Like usually you start with uh, the basic set of alerts, right? And then again, if you're part of feature factory, you're not focusing too much on this. And then you suddenly get in entangled into uh, like building on top of this and you have built an extension and you have built, not built the alerting for it. So every time you are sipping something, are you re-evaluating your alerts? Like, I don't think that happening a lot. And that's the gap, right? So we might have built a system which was like ready, which was serving well and we built the alerts uh, for that. We had that in place and that was serving well. But suddenly you have added a feature which has scaled 10x growth now on your APIs which you have onboarded few more partners which are consuming your API. Now, like if you're not modifying your alerts ecosystem in that respect, like again, you're gonna cause that trouble, right? Uh, and that's the gap which I see that every time, and that's also true for the different paradigm of testing that are you do performance testing, load testing, et cetera, before you're launching something, a new component or new feature, uh, which uh, in certain environment you may not be able to do, but uh, at least the alerting and monitoring if you're not relooking at things that will make life more difficult and I think I wish there was a easier way and a better way which could automatically do it probably with uh, now so much of uh, focus on uh, generative AI which understands your ecosystem probably some tool can come up and bridge this gap that which can automatically regenerate your alerts and rewire the metrics and readjust yeah and someday that can happen uh, so I think that will bring down the context uh, and the need for the teams also but I mean they need to understand but yeah yeah the scenarios that you mentioned I think they are hard to uh, you know occur in large companies where the right. process the ecosystem is very very mature and the SDLC process is quite mature um, right. and the cycle times are long so you typically don't ship anything in uh, the time windows which are measured in days, right. uh, like a day, two days, three days, uh, they'll typically take at least a week and that leaves some time. But startups, when, uh, you know, things can get moving very, very fast. Um, overnight, if, you know, some, uh, let's say a marketing event, uh, etc. goes viral, you are right. suddenly going to have a lot of traffic and traffic probably beyond the point that you haven't expected your system to get uh, more traffic than you ever expected to get. And in those cases, yeah, like it is not possible um, uh, for people to, you know, preemptively think about all of those scenarios. So one extreme is not having any alerts. 
another extreme is having all the alerts beforehand having performance testing beforehand and um you know very very structured case and what sits in the middle is uh the startup um early and the mid stage startups where uh, you can set some hygiene alerts maybe automatically uh and um uh, but what you are saying and i want to amplify this point is that when an issue occurs never let i mean one thing is to solve the issue but never let that opportunity slide to set more alerts so that you don't get reactively pulled into uh, the firefighting and at least the alert will tell you that something um, uh, is happening and go look at it you don't you don't have to wait for somebody to escalate it um why don't people do it uh, seems like very you know natural and very obvious thing to do why don't people set alerts is it just lack of um awareness uh, or is it the lack of technique and the skills or is it lack of time uh, and they are as you said feature factory just love that term um that they are part of a feature factory yeah i think it's a combination of each right uh, and so uh, i don't think it's a problem which is uh, like uh, if you see like every team facing right like it's very uh, in pockets you will find it some people some teams are really mature and doing well with their alerts and monitoring some teams might struggle depends on the kind of maturity level as i said uh, and also the combination of what kind of time they are investing in this kind of practices right uh like and again i don't want to use the feature factory right like it become the catchy word for this uh, whole chat i guess feature uh, factory feature factory right so uh so they like if you are able to get the time to invest in it right and yeah so let's say you got the alert and you have prepared the ais that i have to review the alerts but are you having the time to look at it review and get it right and are you fighting for like and some of times right like and uh, we talked about the owners license and leaders to create that room it's also license senior engineers to fight for these rooms right that hey no i'm going to do this right ask for that time right if you don't ask like like uh, like it's okay owners license on engineer uh, leaders but if they are not focused and they are focused on some other problems you also can step up and take that right that hey we need to invest this time here right So that that's also goes the second way. Um, the th the third thing which I would say is, which is the difficult part, right? Uh, is the lack of awareness, and like the complexity for the complete coverage, right? Like we work with so many moving components, right? Like our infra is hosted on a different third party on a cloud. uh how much of understanding we have like of that ecosystem what happens if like let's say we most often we use gcp and aws and azure right yeah if some bits moves on their side of ecosystem obviously that's going to impact us how do you set the monitoring and alerting for those right like those are like difficult things for everybody to understand of that right uh like you are you at least can relate your service layers that okay hey these are my services these are my apis these are my response time these are my sls which i'll monitor but if you go deeper there are different ways and different components at which we can do monitoring and i think that's where the awareness and complexity is little wide and little vast and people miss out few things here and there in those areas is is my sense like why it is little tricky and why people i don't think that i will attribute the people don't intend to do it it's just that that is little trickier to do it oh interesting so you are saying even if people have the time uh to set up these alerts and let's say the understanding also is there where they understand uh the aws or the gcp or the azure ecosystem whatever cloud they are using even then the challenge is not the time or uh you know the skill but the challenge is the breadth um, um one example is uh lambdas and yeah. uh, cloud functions as they are called in, called in the gcp uh, right. world um uh, how many people would know how to set up correct monitoring on uh, your cloud functions and lambdas uh, the correct way is to first like you have to, you have to have the correct setup uh, let's say you have reasonably good setup and there is some max number of instances that you have set 
but um, uh, the correct alerting would then be that if your uh, invocation count is consistently at that max for a few minutes, that's a red flag because uh, the auto scaling of the cloud function is uh, choking because it's consistently at the max and there is a good chance that there is more load behind it. So mm -hmm. you are soon going to see lags mm -hmm. in that asynchronous processing. And what you're saying is that there are now so many components, a few that I can name is APIs, uh, of course, the APIs, then um, um, the databases, caches, uh, different types of databases, uh, different types of caches, then uh, the pub sub system, the queuing system, um, the asynchronous monitoring, uh, asynchronous uh, like um, um, processing, um, whether it is uh, Lambda or cloud functions, and then there are, uh, you know, batch systems, um, Spring Batch or, you know, Celery, uh, where there are workers. And basically the breadth um, of this is so wide that, uh, and it's an evolving ecosystem. So breadth is one concern, but these components are also getting new capabilities um, every week and every month. And how easy or hard is, is it for an engineer or a team of engineers to keep up with those responsibility, uh, those um, uh, feature sets uh, yeah. that these components get over time. Yeah. And that makes it harder. Um, um, a natural step would be to have some sort of a default set of alerts for each one of them, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, out of the box. Yeah, I, I just said that, like, I'm hoping that probably at some point with all of this uh, evolution and Gen AI, probably. Uh, and before that Gen AI, like as you said, there could be a default alert for each kind of this KPI and matrix. Uh, that's one. But you know, like the more nuanced would be very subjective, which can understand your ecosystem and then uh, try and adjust its alert for like default thresholds also. So I think if that comes up, probably going to be really, really helpful for all the ecosystem. What would this product typically do? So um, as I'm thinking more, uh, one, it'll help you set the alerts. But... Uh, I think reviewing the alerts is also a hard part where, where if creating the alerts itself was hard, um, uh, being able to review them periodically is right. going to be even harder because how would you even enumerate on all of the alerts? Half right. of them are going to be in your cloud. Half of them are going to be in your APM system. Uh, the APM system itself can be very distributed. So maybe for most of it, you're using New Relic or Datadog. But yeah. then some of it is on a custom Prometheus with some custom Grafana and some alerts around that Grafana also and uh, just all over the place. So the second help that this automated system can have is um, uh, just centralize the alert management in uh, one place and people can at least get a starting point of what all alerts exist in my system in this one place um, and get going from there. Interesting, very interesting. Hmm, what else? Covered quite a bit. So we started from the challenges that you were facing, which was um, like the biggest challenge and the limiting uh, sort of a situation was that people were not sharing the knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that caused increased MTTRs for production issues. And from there, we talked about you know, the factors which causes on-call teams to get burnt out and get stressed out and how to prevent it and what cultural aspects prevent them uh, from doing those good things. And the importance of alerting, which you can do, like, which is a preventive uh, sort of a measure to ensure your system's health uh, and why people don't get time, which the breadth of the components uh, is like a challenge. If like, the competency and uh, uh, the time is not the challenge, then the breadth is definitely a challenge. Right, right. Um, wow. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, looks like, you know, we have had a good conversation, happy about uh, the layers that it could uncover. In yeah. this conversation, thank you for. I, think I enjoyed it uh, mostly, like how we catch up over a tea or coffee in our break time, right? So it was similar to that conversation where we could just 
uh, talk uh, free flowing, right? So really enjoyed that, uh, like talking about the kind of we uh, we also I think we had a kind of share kind of problem statements where we have faced these kind of issues and yeah. Uh, so I think that's why we could relate with it. Yeah. For sure, yeah, yeah, Lo love the, uh, um, uh, you know, impromptuness of the conversation, which I have definitely been missing since, uh, you know, the hybrid work started. Yeah. Um, very interesting. And thank you. Thank you for taking out the time today. Uh, love the conversation and would love to have a follow up. I'm sure there is a lot to talk about uh, on a different topic, which is not worth starting today. But would love to have a follow-up conversation with you. Sure. Thanks, Bhavan. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, really looking forward to what kind of content you bring out with us. Uh, all the best. Yeah, looking forward. Thank you, Rajneesh. If you have listened till here, I hope you have learned something new from experiences of Rajneesh. Do check out today's sponsor, 10x Eng. They are building a product to make your alert management streamlined. If you have any feedback, please comment or email us at hello at pakanimu.com. Thumbs if you liked it, subs if you loved it. See you guys next time.